Welcome and thank you for joining us today for today's Speakers Bureau presentation. Uh, my name is Noah Drew and I'm joined today by, by Dr. Uh, Samia Ahmed, who will help educate us on the role of a geriatrician in the delivery of healthcare. Uh, Dr. Ahmed, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you, Drew. Um, Noah, very um, happy to be here. So before we jump in, um, I would just like to kind of remind everyone out there that we do have a chat function here in Zoom. Uh, I encourage you to reach out with any questions that might come up during our conversation and we'll save some time at the end to do some follow up. Um, so to help set the scene, uh, jumping in, uh, Dr. Ahmed, can you share some background on the role of a geriatrician? Yes, happy to do that. So geriatricians are primary care doctors that have an additional training in medical care for diseases and conditions that commonly affect older patients. So generally over the age of 65. Um, we work in a variety of settings to try to make access of care easier for our patients. And, you know, on a broader note, I find that a geriatrician's role is to help acknowledge some of the more practical aspects of getting older. You know, I think our culture tends to have a little bit of a negative perception of the aging process, and it can certainly be very challenging. So as geriatricians, we try to empower our patients and help them navigate the changes that occur during this phase of their life. Okay, that's really helpful and, and nice to know that you're there to support our kind of aging population transition to a different uh, variety of healthcare. Um, what does training look like that might differentiate um, the regular medical student um, from a geriatrician? Where, where would you specialize and how would your training look, you know, different? Right. So as, as a lot of you know, medical school is four years of after, uh, four years of higher postgraduate education after college. And so um, after that, a lot of physicians complete three years of residency, uh, most likely in internal medicine or family medicine and then geriatricians choose to spend an additional one year of specialty training or fellowship learning about medicine specific to ages 65 and older. So as you were going through medical school, what kind of prompted you to be interested in, in geriatrics? How did you get your start or why did you kind of find your passion here? Absolutely. Um, a lot of geriatricians will tell you that they've had some sort of personal connection with a family member. For me, it was my grandparents, you know, uh, my grandmother lived with me for a long time and um, certainly I have a very close relationship with her. So a lot of us have some of that personal relationship. And I think as geriatricians, all of, a lot of us want to provide that holistic approach, the whole person approach to care. And with geriatrics, we have the time and the resources to be able to do that. So where do you provide your care? Um, in what settings? Yes, um, good question. So I love that. I think this is one of the great uh, traits of geri geriatrics is that I can practice in so many different settings without just being limited to my clinic. So it gives a lot of variety to my work week. Some of my colleagues are able to go to nursing homes and long-term care facilities with memory care units. Um, I primarily work in clinic, but I am also in charge of our group's house calls program. So my team and I are able to go to see patients in their homes. Um, and this helps them get access to care without being limited by issues like mobility or transportation. Uh, but in general, geriatricians practice in clinics, hospitals, and even rehabilitation centers. So the idea that you're able to make house calls seems amazing to me. Uh, and you kind of mentioned that you thought it was something that we had lost, had lost favor here in modernity. Um, does that limit the ability, I mean, your ability to... Um, I don't know. It, it just seems like that, that level of service um, would, would sort of limit you to see as many patients as possible, which I'm sure is um, a reality. So do you balance that in some other way to make sure that you're being as effective as possible? That's a very good question. So of course, with house calls, there is uh, limitations in the number of patients that you can see uh, and the time that it takes to travel from um, each person's home. And so I typically am seeing a fewer amount of patients on the day that I set aside for house calls. But there's so many benefits of house calls that I think that it is uh, something that should be utilized more. And to be honest, it's one of the fastest growing modalities of 
um, providing health care. So, and this is a, a tangent out there into left field. Do you see in the future of medicine as we become, as a society, more comfortable with telehealth and, and um, technology that, you know, um, geriatricians or, or the, you know, telehealth in, in the practice of geriatrics will become more prevalent than it is today? Or do you really feel like you need to be with your patient um, when, you're, when you're treating or evaluating? Um, medicine is changing and uh, getting creative in the way that we're providing health. And so uh, telehealth is here to stay. And I think it has a lot of advantages, um, especially in increasing access. Um, Patients in remote areas, rural areas, may not have access to a geriatrician. And so in those circumstances, I think being able to teleconsult with a geriatrician, especially for the families, can be an invaluable resource. Um, with that being said, I think there's just another charm in being able to see patients face to face, seeing what's really going on in their home. And um, to be honest with um, our patient population, you know, there are certain limitations with technology. And so for those uh, patients with dementia or physical impairments, um, there are just undeniable benefits to house calls. Wonderful. Um, you kind of mentioned earlier um, the age that you're working with, but is there a right age for someone to start seeing a geriatrician? So much like a pediatrician cares for you in your earlier stages, I would say a geriatrician cares for you in your later stages of life. Um, we typically say Medicare age or turning 65 is when, you're, when you reach geriatrics age, but aging really is on a spectrum. So you may have a 70 year old woman who only takes a daily aspirin and a multivitamin and she's pretty active and doing well. Um, and on the other hand, you may have a 64-year-old person who's had a stroke and is now having signs of early onset dementia. So it really is dependent on your, on your overall health and how you are managing it. So it sounds like you really meet people where they are in terms of what they need. Um, what are some of the signs and that it might be time to transition over to a geriatrician? That's a very good question, Noah. A lot of times it's unclear for family members, you know, especially as uh, things change. So um, I guess I'll start by saying that if you already have a primary care physician that you've been seeing for a while and they're comfortable in providing care for you as you get older, then by all means, you know, stay with that physician. But as we age, we start having to address things that maybe we didn't have to think about before. And sometimes a regular primary care provider may not have the time or the understanding needed to address the way our lives change as we get older. So, for example, if you find that you're on a lot of medications or you're seeing too many specialists, um, or you or your family have noticed subtle changes in your personality or memory, those may be, a, those indicate that maybe it is a good time to at least get evaluated by a geriatrician. Okay. Um, in your work, how do you support your patient's health goals and wishes? So once you actually have someone who's transitioned over to your care, um, what are some of the things that you focus on or what matters to you as a provider? Yeah, so... Um, in geriatrics, we talk about the five M's, mind, mobility, um, medications, multi-complexity. So all your medical conditions, how they interact with each other, how they're affecting each other, and is there anything that is conflicting the other? And then most importantly, what matters most to the patient? So by focusing on what matters most to the patient, we can engage in shared decision making and problem solve together how we can best achieve that goal. Um, for example, if the goal is to continue living independently for as long as possible, then the patient and I can sit down together and talk about what services we can bring in to best support that goal. And you know that is, that is one aspect of house calls that I enjoy the most. 
we actually have an interprofessional team that consists of a pharmacist, a social worker, a nurse, and a physical therapist, and myself, and we all sit together and discuss uh, the patient's care. And with recommendations from each specialty, we're able to address the needs of the patient in a more holistic manner. So if the ultimate goal is to improve quality of life and function, um, we're able to do that in a more cohesive way. And also, um, a lot of times we're able to figure out more creative and unique ways to support the needs of the caregiver. That makes a lot of sense. Um, and you mentioned house calls again. Can you maybe elaborate a little bit more on, on what that looks like? Yes, yes, absolutely. I just assume that people know about this, but so house calls is very, are very interesting to me because, you know, I always just assumed that it was something that doctors used to do back in the day and no longer relevant to the way medicine is practiced now. Um, I was first introduced to this format of home visits during residency um, when I was seeing a few of my very complex patients who weren't able to come into clinic um, for whatever reasons. And then during fellowship in Nebraska, I worked with this really amazing physician. She was so compassionate and just an amazing doctor, Dr. Mostek. Um, she was seeing patients in their homes and also doing um, evaluations for adult protective services. So very, very challenging circumstances, if you can imagine. And it really just opened my eyes to what this model of care could offer. You know, um, I think we underestimate the amount of patients that need home-based care. Um, there are some statistics that say that there's about 2 million what we call invisible homebound adults who are seriously ill or frail or have so many medical problems that coming into clinic on a routine basis is just very difficult. So by not coming in, their medical problems are either getting worse or more complicated. And that's what we don't want for you to become ill or hospitalized frequently because you are not able to come into clinic in the first place. So that being said, can you maybe help us understand how a patient accessing home health care could benefit them? Uh, can you clarify what you mean by home health care? Because oh, home sorry. health care is something entirely different. And that's, and that's me being a, a, a lay uh, host here. So no, um, you assessing a patient in the home, to use yeah. the proper terminology or, or the question I'm trying to ask. Yes, so that, that actually um, should be something that clarified. So a lot of patients that, are, that have Medicare benefits receive home health care, which is through a third party company where a nurse um, or a physical therapist or an occupational therapist come to your home a few times a week uh, to improve certain goals, mobility or manage your medicines, etc. What we provide is a physician or the house calls program is where a physician or a nurse practitioner comes into you to do a office visit just in the home setting. Okay. Does that kind of help answer the initial question? I think it does. I think we stumbled into a good point of clarification. Um, you know, so thank you. I, I think that's great. Um, I imagine that, um, you know, you're, they're probably better able to um, get a personal connection like you alluded to earlier with the patients that you're seeing. Um, do you ever evaluate the environment that you see your patients living in or is that something you might feel to the interprofessional team that you're working with? Absolutely. So I think one of the most amazing benefits of being able to go into a patient's home is the personal connection that you build with them. You know, it's a much different experience than in a structured clinic environment where power dynamics can be a confounding factor. So when I go into a patient's house, I'm a guest in their home. Um, it gives me a window into their life, you know, their interests, you know, the photos that they have up or some of the things or hobbies that they do, um, the lifestyle, and a lot of times family dynamics. So... I, for example, um, I recently went into a patient's home who had been discharged from a hospital and now recently had 
um, a lot of leg swelling. And going into their home, I initially noticed that there was a lot of clutter, barely enough room to walk. The patient was at a risk for falls. And I felt that, you know, safely, she could not manage this leg swelling at home. And so we were able to quickly discuss this with the team and have her admitted to a rehab facility. Uh, so there's a lot of things that you do pick up and just from the environment. That's and it. I also find that patients often open up about their difficulties or worries or anxieties much more when they're in an environment that they're most comfortable. That makes perfect sense um, that you would maybe get a little bit more honesty or transparency from patients too. Um, I imagine that that white coat syndrome that people sometimes experience going into the clinic, do you find that that disappears a little bit when you're coming to them? It surely does, but there's still those a few patients that do get nervous and I try to smile, although it's harder with a uh, full PPE on. I think people have a hard time reading facial expressions with that. I'm sure, yeah. I'm just, I keep on looking for, you know, those smile lines in people's <laughs> eyes now in the store when I get too close, but that's, that's where we are today. Um, another one of those kind of phrases or terms that has a lot of different meanings depending on what circle you're, you're running in is caregivers. Um, you've talked a little bit about family, but um, can you maybe talk a little bit about how, um, you know, what caregivers means to you in, in your work and kind of the role that they play with your patients? Absolutely, absolutely. So um, one of the huge benefits of um, having more time in house calls is that I'm able to pay more attention to the caregivers and the immense role that they play. You know, there are about 6 million people in America that are providing care for a loved one without pay. And so that's your spouses and adult children. And it truly is due to their sacrifice and 24 seven efforts that a lot of elderly patients are able to live at home and uh, stay out of the nursing home. And so I'd say that the caregivers are the real heroes here and are often providing nursing care that they were not trained to. So when I go into a home, I'm able to pay more attention to their needs and also provide education on what to do when um, their loved one is having a bad day and how we can make medication adjustments based on that, or even what medical equipment is needed. You know, should we bring in a Hoyer lift because they're lifting the patient up several times a day, uh, several times a day, and that's, you know, causing back issues for them. And so um, there's just a lot more time that um, we can spend with them. And um, no, you raise a really good point. Um, Caregivers are often so underlooked, but um, caregiver burnout, caregiver burnout is a real thing. And it's something that we routinely assess for. Um, if you can imagine, and it only makes sense that, you know, their studies actually prove that um, by addressing caregiver burden, we can really prolong, that, uh, prolong the time that a patient can live independently and delay nursing home placement by at least 18 months. And that makes all the sense in the world that that care would be delivered um, at home at an elevated level if the people who are giving the care are able to do that in a joyful way, in a way that's not stressing them. Are there any resources you might um, send a family toward or a caregiver toward if you sense that they are getting burned out and maybe need some relief or, or just need some help kind of coping with, with their day-to-day -day life? Absolutely. Our social workers uh, in the geriatrics department are a wonderful resource. They're quickly able to find based on the level of caregiver needs, um, if they can bring in a primary home care attendant or a home aide. Um, sometimes that's private pay, sometimes that can be uh, paid by insurance companies or Medicare or Medicaid. Um, there's also respite services where a caregiver it can leave their home to, to attend to their self-care and you know errands several hours a day and not have to worry about their loved one at home where someone else steps in for those designated hours. And so there are a lot of resources out there for caregivers. Um, there's also educational classes. Sorry, I interrupted you. Oh, no, 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 vice versa. No, I, I, I'm sorry. Um, educational classes, was that, does that kind of 
Sorry. Uh, educational classes for caregivers where they're able to kind of talk to a group of people in similar situations and kind of brainstorm together how they deal with these challenging circumstances and also take care of themselves. Perfect. Um, yeah, I imagine having that peer support is really important. I'm just I'm so excited because um, there's just so many things that, that you know, kind of come out of this. Um, if we're talking about family at, at this point, um, what if you, you know, are or someone who has an older family member, they still seem like they are, um, you know, functioning, but maybe they have a couple of issues that, that maybe, you know, tell them it's time to elevate the level of care or expertise that they're seeking. What role does a family play in helping an older um, family member kind of make the transition or help make decisions? I say family plays the biggest role in a lot of this. Um, a lot of it is also dependent on the patient and how much they have involved family into their medical care up until this time. And so sometimes where a geriatrician can step in is getting the, helping the patient understand that we are in a different place now and that we do need help from family members. And um, that's, where, that's where I think transitioning to a geriatrician can be helpful. Yeah, and, and those discussions can be hard. It's, it's really hard. Personally, um, my grandparents are sort of shifting to the age where they maybe need an elevated level of care and they've been so independent. Um, and, and it's just really hard um, to maybe have that discussion and, and lead them along. But we've we found that persistence seems to kind of work and you know, provide support that, they <laughs> that, that they're willing to take. Um, you briefly touched on how COVID is kind of impacting and wearing PPE and masks. Um, are there any other ways that the pandemic has affected the way that you provide care? Uh, absolutely. I think if anything, we have gone on more house calls during the pandemic. Um, you know, our this has been a very challenging time for our elderly patients who are most vulnerable. Uh, even if they're not homebound per se due to dementia or a physical impairment, they're high risk due to their chronic conditions or simply their age. And so they they have limited access to medical care. Um, our clinic here at the Health Science Center had closed temporarily, um, but we felt that it was absolutely essential to continue to provide medical care. And so with the HSC House Calls program, we were quickly able to mobilize and meet the needs of even non-homebound patients during this pandemic. We feel fortunate that we've conducted over 180 house call visits between March and now. And we also received, yeah, yeah, um, initially, you know, we, we were lucky to have PPE and I think that was, um, that was really our biggest asset there. Uh, and also our wonderful team. Um, we received re referrals for several patients who did not have a PCP and um, or you know would not have got their medications refilled or would have otherwise had to go to the ED. Um, so we 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 were able to take care of them. That's incredible. I didn't thank you for sharing those statistics. I'm really happy that y'all were able to pivot and, and continue to provide such a great level of care. Um, I do have a couple of questions from the audience if we've got some time for that. Um, the first one I've got, it looks like we're kind of combining the two. Um, how would you find a good geriatrician in the community where my parents live, like not Fort Worth? So I guess it's someone who has parents that live in another town. How can you help them find the geriatrician? That is a good question. Geriatricians are a scarce commodity. Um, I would say, you know, and I would say if, and most of, I'm assuming if you're, uh, if you're at that age, you have Medicare, um, not everything is available on, if you just go to like medicare.gov, so you wouldn't be able to find like a geriatrician, but there's other resources at americangeriatricsociety.org or uh, US News and World Report. Um, their healthcare section has a list of doctors um, that you can look up by zip code and with a specialty geriatrics. And so that itself is a good resource. Um, I know AARP in general has a lot of resources just as far as navigating Medicare plans and 
other toolkits. I'm not exactly sure if they have resources on finding a provider, but uh, some of the resources that I mentioned are a good start. That's perfect, thank you. So um, next question here is, what kind of questions or what are some factors um, that you might consider when you're helping or when you're trying to evaluate a, a geriatrician, I guess if you're trying to find the right person for you? Absolutely. Um, I think that um, when you're assessing uh, if a doctor is the right fit for you, the communication that you get from your first visit speaks a long way, whether, that, whether or not you felt that your concerns were heard appropriately, whether or not, that, whether or not they had an understanding of your medical conditions, whether they were willing to spend time with you. Those are all good things to consider. Um, and I also say that, you know, it takes time to build a relationship with a physician. So um, a lot of patients that come to us had been previously seeing uh, physicians for 20, 30, 40 years. And so I understand that, you know, um, I'm not going to get that during the first visit. And I am honest with patients about that. I'm like, you know, I'm starting to get to know you here, but I promise I want to help you uh, in any way I can. Um, and I, I think you can, you know, generally tell when you're comfortable with someone and when you're getting the appropriate level of customer service. I, that's, that's perfect. Um, next question that came through, um, home visits seem to be extremely beneficial to getting to know your patients in a more personal level and understanding their needs. Um, how would you replicate that when you are seeing patients in the clinic to make sure that they're getting the same level of care and understanding from you? Right. I think it's all about the team, to be honest with you. Even if in the outpatient clinic setting, if we are, if the clinic has the ability to utilize their social worker, their pharmacist, and uh, even physical therapist, if they have one on staff, I think that interprofessional team approach um, speaks a long way in terms of providing, improving outcomes for patients. And so, um, going to a clinic that has some of those ancillary services is very beneficial for overall health. So it's like you read the, the next question's mind. Uh, it deals with interprofessional um, practice here. How do you see the pharmacist role being expanded in the geriatric realm? It's so important. Um, you know, polypharmacy is a real problem and a lot of times, you know, patients have accumulated medica as many medications as years of their life. And some of them are appropriate while others are not. And, you know, the way our body uh, metabolizes these medications changes as we get older. And so there's more side effects and there's more interactions. Um, some medications even lead to um, higher rates of dementia. And so having a pharmacist review your medication list, whether that's your clinical pharmacist or your ambulatory Walgreens CVS pharmacist routinely is very important. So, and, and the next question is really what you've just said, how important is it for the clinician to have an accurate medication list for management? And it sounds like very is the answer. Yes, 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 yes. So we're always reconciling meds and we ask our patients, please bring your bottles um, at every visit because what we may have in our computer system is different from what the pharmacy may have and different from what the patient's doing at home. And so, you know, limiting errors at all of those levels is essential to avoid any adverse events that can occur from taking medications incorrectly. Um, you know, it's funny, when I go on house calls visits, I spend a lot of time on medicines and it's amazing how sometimes patients organize their meds. You know, there's a huge box of supplements and then there's one pill box for medicines that they don't take. And then there's another box, you know, and so it does take time to sort through, but I think uh, you really do pick up a lot on how someone is managing their medicines. Sure, I bet you can learn a lot about just how they're living and, and what they need based on how they're doing some of those um, organizational things for sure. Um, we don't have any more questions here, and, and we kind of rolled right in at the half hour mark, which was sort of our goal. So um, at this time, I, I just want to thank you so much for sharing with us today and for joining us and helping to kind of educate us on the role of a geriatrician. 
You're so welcome, Noah. I've certainly enjoyed chatting here and uh, thank you very much. You've been the perfect guest. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you everyone out there, um, we will send a recording out and I will um, make sure that we tag the resources in the video that we mentioned at like the 27 minute mark. So if you were furiously taking notes, we'll make sure that those resources get out there. So um, I'm gonna sign off and thank you all very much for uh, joining in and we hope to see you next week. Thank Bye. you.